is thy faithfulness. What a wonderful song to think about and the words to think on as we begin a new year. Happy New Year to each one of you. We wish you God's richest blessings and his guidance and direction and strength for 2021. We made it through 2020. Praise the Lord. And uh, it can't get any worse than that. I guess it could, but uh, we have uh, much to look forward to in 2021 as we are watching and waiting and looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, today we're um, going to start off our year with um, a little reflection. You know, sometimes we need, to, we need to look back before we can look forward. And um, we've been looking forward uh, all of 2021 um, in the book of Revelation since, since May, looking forward to those things which must shortly come to pass, as the Bible says, um, in regards to the, um, the future of the world and, of course, the great coming kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, where he will rule and reign from Jerusalem. But the fact of the matter is we still live on this earth now, and uh, there's still battles to fight. There's still wars that are being waged. And... Um, you know, as much as we may sometimes be focusing on those things because, um, you know, that is where we are living in the day-to-day -day moment, there's things that we have to stand up against. The Bible says that we are to have nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather uh, reprove them. Yet at the same time, we need to be looking to the Lord through all of this, keeping our focus on Him rather than on the situations, on the circumstances. Um, on the works of the enemy, and of course, even on the enemy himself, but we are not, of course, ignorant of his devices. But thank God we have um, his word, uh, which gives us examples, of course, of those that have gone before us. So today, if you have your Bibles, turn with me back to the book of Lamentations as we take a look back uh, at the beginning of this year before we begin, of course, looking forward again to what God will do in the coming days, and as we continue to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Today we're going to look at um, Lamentations chapter 3, we'll be looking at some other portions here in Jeremiah, some other places in the Word of God as well, but our text for today is Lamentations chapter 3, we'll begin reading in verse uh, 21, Lamentation, Lamentations three twenty one. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul, therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait, for the salvation of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this new year, new opportunities, Lord, um, new vision, new direction that you give us for this new year. And Father, we live in a world that's very discouraging, but we pray, Lord, that you would help us once again to see the truth of who you are, understand the foundation of our faith, understand that you are at work, Lord, even in a dark world. And Father, we thank you that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them are the call according to your purpose. And you've told us in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us. And so, Father, help us to be a thankful people. Help us, Lord, to be a people that have hope, that are looking forward, even amidst uh, and in a hopeless world. Father, we pray that we might have hope, that we might bring hope to those that are lost and without hope and without God in this world people who so desperately need a Savior but are looking to all the world's um, solutions in order to bring, uh, bring, bring peace and the things that, that only you can bring, um, trying to bring those things through, through um, short-sighted efforts. But Lord, we thank you for the far-sightedness of your word, and we thank you for those who had the insight and the foresight and the far-sightedness um, those who have gone before us, Lord, those who knew you and walked with you, we thank you now for this portion of the scripture. We pray that you speak to our hearts. Give each one of us what we stand in need of this morning, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, the Book of Lamentations is a series of songs of mourning. You say, well, Pastor, why are you starting out the year looking at these series of songs of mourning? So we're not looking at it all entirely, but we have to remember the context. They were written against the backdrop of the Babylonian invasion, the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem, which was, of course, God's judgment on Israel. In these verses of this book, we can also see the awful sufferings that were endured by the people of the city at the hand of their enemies. Still, even in the midst of all this pain, in the midst of all this turmoil, God had his man there in Jerusalem to record the events and also to remind the people of their need for God in that hour. The writer of the Book of Lamentations is believed to be Jeremiah. He was known, of course, as the weeping prophet. Uh, a study of Jeremiah's life tells us of really unending sadness and deep depression that he had because of the weight that he carried. When he prophesied against the sin of Israel, he saw his own sin. He recognized his own, um, his own shortcomings. And so when he wept before the people and he wept before God, he wept on behalf not only of realizing and pointing out their sins, but realizing and pointing out his own as well. Well, here's some of his background. He, rec he received an unwanted call to ministry. He received an unwanted call to ministry. Sometimes it's that way. Sometimes you say, Lord, why me? Why are you having uh, us be involved in this? Why do we have to be, as Christians, the ones who, you know, sometimes are the bearers of bad news? You know, I mean, obviously we're bringing good news, but that good news comes with bad news as well because nobody can receive the good news until they first receive the bad news and it's always been that way because there's no salvation without repentance. But let's look back at Jeremiah chapter 1 and we see this call that Jeremiah received. Jeremiah chapter 1 beginning in verse 5 the Bible says here, Before I formed thee, God says, in the belly I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb I sanctified thee and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I shall command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. And so he received this unwanted Called to minister, but he also called, was called to a ministry of preaching nothing but judgment. <laughs> preaching nothing but judgment. We see this in uh, chapter 1 of Jeremiah, going on to verse 9, here from where we've read, picking it up there. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set over thee the nations. I have set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Well, Jeremiah had a, you know, he had a call of God. He had a difficult um, call. He had a difficult mission. But not only that, he was also not allowed to marry. He was not allowed to marry so, and so, so that he might give himself more fully uh, to his ministry of proclaiming the impending judgment of God. Flip with me ahead to chapter 16 of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 16, we'll begin reading at verse 1. The word of the Lord came also unto me, saying, Thou shalt not take thee a wife, neither shalt thou have sons or daughters in this place. For thus saith the Lord concerning the sons and concerning the daughters that are born in this place and concerning their mothers that have bare them and concerning their fathers that begat them in this land. They shall die of grievous deaths. They shall not be lamented. Neither shall they be buried. But they shall be as dung upon the face of the earth. And they shall be consumed by the sword and by famine. And their carcasses shall be meat for the fowls of heaven and for the beasts of the earth. For thus saith the Lord, Enter not into the house of mourning, neither go to lament nor bemoan them. For I have taken away my peace from this people, saith the Lord, even loving kindness and mercies. Both the great and the small shall die in this land. They shall not be buried, neither shall men lament for them, nor cut themselves, nor make themselves bald for them. 
Neither shall men tear themselves for them in mourning, to comfort them for the dead. Neither shall men give them the cup of consolation to drink for their father or for their mother. Thou shalt not go uh, into the house of feasting to sit with them to eat and to drink. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will cause to cease out of this place in your eyes and in your uh, days the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. And it shall come to pass when thou shalt show this people all these words that they shall say unto thee, Wherefore hath the Lord pronounced all this great evil against us? Or what is our iniquity? Or what is our sin that we have committed against the Lord our God? Then shalt thou say unto them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, saith the Lord, and have walked after other gods, and have served them, and have worshipped them, and have forsaken me, and have not kept my law, and ye have done worse than your fathers. For behold, ye walk every one after the imagination of his evil heart, and that they may not hearken unto me. Therefore will I cast you out of this land, into a land that ye know not, neither ye nor your fathers that shall... That shall um, and neither neither ye nor your fathers, and there shall you serve other gods day and night, where I will not show you favor. <laughs> and so, Jeremiah, um, he had a heavy call. He was not able to marry, and of course, because of this, he was not only did he not have that affection and that companionship of a wife and a family and children. But all the people, didn't also as we see here, they didn't want to hear his message. And so he was a very lonely man. He was a man of deep sadness, and he wept openly uh, for the sins of the people. We see this in verse 1 of Jeremiah chapter 9. Oh, that my head were waters, and my eyes were a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the sins, or for the slain of the daughters of my people. And so he endured depression really, as a result of his message going unheeded for so long. He even, he even came to the point where he tried to get out of the ministry altogether. We see this in Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9. The Bible says, Then said I, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire, shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. So in other words, he's saying, you know, I didn't even want to speak in the name of God anymore. I didn't want to bring his message, but his, his word was like a fire uh, in my, in, uh, in a burning fire in my bones, and uh, his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. Um, and he was weary with not speaking it out anymore, with holding it back. And he, the Bible says that he could not stay. He could not, in other words, keep quiet. He could not stop preaching what God had called him to do because it was God's call on his life. And so uh, his pain, though, of course, is understandable because in a ministry of about 50 years, there's no record of even one convert in the ministry of Jeremiah. There's not, a, there's not an account of one person coming to a place of repentance and heeding the message that God gave Jeremiah to bring to the people of Israel. He suffered imprisonment by King Zedekiah because the king did not approve of his preaching. We see this in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 5, where the Bible says, And he shall lead Zedekiah to Babylon, and there shall he be until I visit him, saith the Lord. Though ye, though ye fight with the Chaldeans, ye shall not prosper. And so even while the Babylonians are invading the city uh, of Jerusalem in fulfillment of his declarations, Jeremiah is, uh, is sitting in a dungeon, we see in Jeremiah chapter 32, uh, verse 2. After Jerusalem falls and many had been killed or taken captive, the prophet is also broken with the, with the remnant um, and enters into suffering with them. And so the suffering of the people is also upon him. He suffers with them because of their sin and because of his own uh, sin as well. Um, the effects of sin... We may be forgiven of sin when we, when we come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but there, is, there are still consequences of sin. We've, we've talked about that many times. And it could be consequences of sin in our own life because of a particular lifestyle that we have lived for, for, for a number of years before we came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
But I want to think about that for a moment this morning in regards to the world in which we live. You know, we are saved and we have a home in heaven. We are citizens of heaven as we've been talking about. But the fact of the matter is that the consequences of sin in, uh, in this world that affect our life are still something that we have to live with. And sometimes as Christians, um, we have the notion that, you know, new believers sometimes, I think, that we come to faith in Christ and suddenly everything's going to be fine, everything's going to be wonderful. Well, the fact of the matter is that many times as Christians, we have to go through the same struggles, the same problems as the unsaved people around us. But the difference is, when we keep our eyes on the Lord, we understand that He is with us, that He walks with us through every trial, and that He has given us direction. And we have a plan, we have a purpose, we have a hope, of course, because of our Savior, and He will bring us through to the desired end, of course. And so after enduring a life like this, after being rejected, after being hated, after being mocked, imprisoned, ignored, after seeing His beloved Jerusalem ransacked, desecrated, destroyed, after experiencing the horror of war, the brutality of the enemy, and the pangs of hunger, Jeremiah was still able to stand amid the rubble of the city and the bodies of the dead, and he was able to lift up his voice in praise to God for his great, unfailing faithfulness to his people. Well, how is this possible? How is he able to do this? Well, despite his trials, despite his troubles, Jeremiah had a good grasp on the reality of who God is. Jeremiah knew that whether things went well or whether everything fell apart, God would still be God and that he would be eternally faithful to his people. As we see in our text in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 21, he says, This I recall to my mind. This I recall to my mind. Therefore have I hope. Jeremiah was still able to find hope in a hopeless situation because he believed in the faithfulness of his great God. And so these things, you know, there are many things that enter our mind. There are many things that affect us when we see the troubles around us, when we see the troubles of others, when we see the judgment of God upon the lives of other people. And you just want to shake them and say, you know, turn from your sin and trust Christ and he will forgive you and give you new guidance, new direction in your life. You don't have to chase after this anymore and continue to believe the lie or whatever it might be. Sometimes these things can totally frustrate us, but the answer as it was for Jeremiah is still true today and that is that we need to recall to our mind. We need to recall to our mind and the only way that this can happen, of course, is if our mind is renewed to the Word of God. That's why it's so important to be in the Word of God as we begin a new year. Begin a new year with a purpose and a desire to be in the Word of God more than you were last year. And, um, and, uh, and, and seek the Lord and find out what it is that He, what His plan is, what His purpose is, uh, not only for in general, but of course also for your own personal life. And so, like Jeremiah, we all go through times in life when things seem to fall apart. When these times come, we also need the assurance, of course, the deep-rooted assurance. Not just something that somebody says to us or something that we read, um, you know, as a post on Facebook. But we need to have the, the, uh, the assurance ourselves, the full assurance that God is faithful, of course. Thankfully, the Bible gives overwhelming evidence of the unchanging faithfulness of our great God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The word faithfulness in verse 23 is a word which means firmness. It means uh, fidelity. It means steadfastness. It means steadiness. That's what the word faithfulness means. And so this word pictures God as one upon whom we can depend. We can be sure that as we face the storms and trials and the valleys of life, God will ever prove himself to be steadfast and faithful to us. We can count on the Lord God because he is, as the Bible says, Jehovah Jireh, our provider. And so we see three words in these verses that tell us why Jeremiah was able to proclaim, great is thy faithfulness. First of all, we see that God is faithful in his grace. We see this in verse 22. Jeremiah seems to be remembering that 
It was the grace of God, of course, that brought Israel out of their slavery in Egypt. Remember, God wanted them to always remember these things and to put these things, um, you know, even though we're God is frontlets before their eyes because he understood how quickly and how soon they would forget. This is why he had them go through the motions and the ceremonies and the, um, you know, the religious activities that they did, which would bring these things to their remembrance. Um, but it was something that, uh, because it was so soon for them to forget, but it was easy for them to forget. But the thing is that the religious activities were not to be the be-all and end-all. They were just to be something that would focus them and help them to remember what God had done in the past and also to look forward to what he would do in the future um, in the coming of the Messiah, the Lamb of God, which would take away the sin of the world. And so Jeremiah is remembering uh, that it was the grace of God that brought Israel out of their slavery in Egypt. It was also grace that had kept them a redeemed people in spite of their failures, in spite of their wanderings. Is this working? Okay. Uh, and so uh, he was remembering these things. Remember, it's his grace. It's the grace of God that saves us. Only grace could have reached us. Only the grace of God could have reached us in our lost and in our doomed condition. This grace was always extended. But there are times where after man hardens his heart so much, God says, okay, enough is enough. His grace is always extended. But there comes a time where man, by his own free will, turns his back on God. And this is what we see happening uh, in our world today as a whole. We're coming to the place where we are nearing the end of the age of grace. God continues to extend his grace and is, is, is continuing to extend his grace. But there will come a time where man, as man, is continuing to say no, no, no to God. God's going to say, okay, you said no to me. You, you, don't want, uh, the, you don't want the true Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who taketh away the sin of the world. Then I will give you your own Superman that you want. I will give you the Antichrist. He is the one you want. He is the one you will have. <clears throat> and sadly, the world will face... Um, the judgment of God through this because it, the, they will face the effects and the realities of Satan Superman <clears throat> excuse me on this world but it's only grace that could have reached us in our lost condition we read of this in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 5 where the Bible says and you hath he quickened or made alive in other words who were dead in trespasses and sins wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our conversation or our lifestyle in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. And so in the same sense, <clears throat> just as the children of Israel were walking according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience, we lived in that time as well. The difference is that when we heard the message, when we heard the message of salvation, if we're truly saved today, born again, we, re we responded with a repentant heart, and so we were saved. Sadly, the children of Israel, uh, they could have they could have also responded, just like Jesus when, when Jesus walked this earth and he wept over, wept over Jerusalem. <clears throat> when much of Israel was still in rebellion towards God, he said, I would gather ye as a hen gathers her chicks, but ye would not. And so God is always willing. God is always willing, not wanting that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the choice is up to each one of us to recognize our sin as the conviction of God comes and then to say, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And so God can change the life of an individual who once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit of Antichrist, in other words, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And God can change that and we can be made new creatures in Christ. But we could not get to God, of course, and so God came to us. We could not reach God by any of our good works. Nothing we do can ever appease 
a holy God, but he, of course he came as a babe in a manger the pers in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ to live for us, uh, to die for our sins, and to rise again from the dead, of course, in order to give us new life and the power of his Holy Spirit so that we might be transformed and changed and conformed to the image of Christ um, and our life might become more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ until the day we see him. Philippians 2, 5 and 8, the Bible says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Having been found in, the fashion, in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And so we see and we understand that his grace saves us, but his grace also secures us. Grace not only sought us out when we were lost in sin. The Bible says the Holy Spirit has gone into the world to reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. That is the grace of God. That is the grace of God reaching out to every man, searching and seeking for the lost, because the conviction has to come first, and that comes by the Holy Spirit, that people might see their undone state. And there's only one or two ways that a person can go then. They will either become better by repenting and believing in Christ, or they will become bitter against the God of heaven, because they won't want God to be interfering in their life. They want to they, they don't want him cramping their style. They don't want him coming in and telling them what to do. It is their mentality towards us, even though God is trying to um, bring the solution to the problem, they only see him as somebody trying to interfere in their lifestyle because they love their sin more than they love the God who created them. And so not only does grace seek us and search us out when we're lost in sin, grace is what keeps us in our saved condition. And this is what's so important for us to understand and to know that we know that we know as believers. Um, everyone is prone to failure. We are prone to spiritual wandering in our because the, 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 the appetite of the flesh has not been eradicated. If our salvation depended on our, our ability to be faithful to God, none of us would ever be saved because if that was true in regards to our, 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 you know, our being able to remain saved, it would also have to be true for salvation in the first place, in which case we would be saved by our works and not by grace. But we are saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, the Bible says. And so we are saved by His grace, and we are kept by that same grace, and we must live in that grace now, you see. And this comes through a, trans, a, a, a transformation of the mind through the Word of God. Because if we are, if we are focused on our, on our uh, inabilities, or, uh, or if we are focused on, on, our, um, on our shortcomings, or if we're focused on the world around us, then we are not able to focus on Christ in us, the hope of glory, and able to see how he is continuing, he who has begun a good work in us, is continuing until the day of Christ, until the day we are taken home. And, um, and then we're just like Peter there on the Sea of Galilee, where when he was looking to Jesus, he had great strength and ability. Was that strength and ability his own? Of course not. As he looked to Jesus, he had great strength and ability to do that which was completely humanly impossible. But as soon as he took his eyes off the Lord Jesus Christ, he began sinking in the water. And you know what that would be like. It would not be a very nice situation. But many Christians are sinking in the water. They're, they're grasping for, gasping for breath and they're taking in more water than they are air in the spiritual in their spiritual life, and we cannot begin a new year. As the world gets darker around us, the darkness will engulf us, and we will be drowning in the darkness if we are not continuing to look to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're saved by His grace. We are kept by that same grace, and we must live in that grace. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, 
Jesus answered and said unto her, um, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And so thank God for his unfailing, his unchanging, and his faithful grace. And so God is faithful in his grace. And then we see, continuing on in verse 22 to 23, God is faithful in his gifts. God did not promise an easier road in, his, in life. But he promised that his grace would be sufficient for any road that we have to travel in life. And there are many different roads that Christians have traveled throughout history. And there's many different roads that, that we may have to travel within our own life. We may be on one road for a period of time and then God may move us onto another road. But he promised that his grace would be sufficient for any road that we have to travel. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 Verse 9, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now remember, this is the Apostle Paul, the, the one who was taken to, uh, into heaven, the heaven of heavens, and saw things that could not even be uttered on earth, things that he did not have words in, the, in, in, um, in human vocabulary. He could not even describe them. Okay, so, and then God allowed a, a thorn in his flesh, a, a, a physical uh, ailment of some type. And he said he sought the Lord three times that God would remove this from him. God had done so many things for him. He was um, used of God in such a wonderful way. And yet, God said to him, No, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And so the Apostle Paul, he came to... He came to um, a place of acceptance with that, and then he, and then he um, said, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And so, we understand our weaknesses, whether it be a physical weakness, a physical impairment that God has not healed us of, or whether it be, you know, something else in life, whether it be, um, you know, so, something that, you know, a, a habitual sin, a lifestyle that we were involved in in the past, and we realize that we need the grace of God, the strength of God, in order to stay away from that alcohol, or to stay away from whatever the sin might have been that we were involved in for so long in the past. We understand that, that um, the appetite may not disappear entirely. God may not eradicate it because we're still in the flesh, but we understand that His grace is sufficient, and that as we're looking to Him and as we're trusting Him, then the, as we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And so, whether it be you know financial uh, difficulties, whether it be you know any number of things that can happen in this life, God, we can we can continue to pray and ask God, of course, to to help us, to help our family, to help others that we know and love, to remove that situation to heal them, to bring solutions to those problems, but ultimately, of course, we must continue to uh, look to the Lord and trust that in every situation, um, His strength is made perfect in weakness. Well, grace is often defined by the acronym, you've heard me say it before, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. And so Christianity are the, you know, our relationship with God, are, are the free gift, the gift of salvation is free. It came freely to us. It's not something we can work for, not something we can earn. But it came at a great expense. It came at the expense of the God of heaven, uh, leaving heaven's glory to become a man, to take our sin upon himself, to, 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 to die a horrible death, uh, and shed his life's blood so that our sins might be cleansed and washed away. It is a free gift, but it came at a great expense. And so the unmerited love and favor of God towards sinners is another definition of the grace of God. The unmerited love and favor of God towards sinners. It also speaks to the strength of God to face battles and to bear up under times of difficulty. And so we should always remember that regardless of what life sends our way, we can be confident of the fact that the Lord will give us the necessary strength that we need 
to face uh, the trying times of life. You'll never face a situation as a believer that God will not give you the grace and the strength to help you through it if you will look to Him. If you look at the water, if you look at the storm, and that's what you're focusing on, then you know, you're going to miss out on the grace of God. But if you look to Jesus, then you will receive this grace and strength. Hebrews 4.16. Hebrews 4.16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Well, let's think about several of the gifts, several of, uh, of his gifts. The, gifts of his, the gift of his presence, of course. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. The gift of his presence. These are gifts that we are bringing with us into the new year, into, into the unknown of 2021. We have no idea what the future holds. 2020 was not a great year. We hope 2021 will be better, but in, you know, from a human perspective, it could be far worse. We don't know. It may get a lot worse before it gets better, but we have the gift of his presence. Jesus said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Matthew 28, verse 20, Jesus said, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And so these verses, along with others, reveal the great truth that God is always present with us. Even when he cannot be seen, he is always there watching over us. Well, we also have the gift of his performance. The gift of his performance as we enter this new year. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or even think. So it's not dependent on our ability. There are things that we have to do because we're saved, right? We have a, we're not saved by works, but we have a faith that works. And God gives us the grace and strength to be able to do those things. He changes our life so that we in turn will do things and that those things will impact the lives of others and be an encouragement to them, be a catalyst for them to move forward, whatever it might be. But think of the word able. If this verse is to be taken at face value, and I'm sure that it is, then it becomes clear that God is greater by far than any problem we have or by, than any problem that we will ever face. God is an awesome God, and we need to remember the great truth about who God is, His very character, knowing that God will take care of us in every situation. And so we have also the gift, not only the gift of His presence and the gift of His performance, but we have the gift of His person, the greatest gift of all, of course. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. These verses reveal the truth about God's nature that make Him reliable at all times. That's simply the fact that He does not change. He changes not. Hard for us to understand because people can change a lot. People that we've known maybe in our lifetime, there's some people maybe they haven't changed that much, but there's other people and they go, and you think, man, I haven't seen that person for a while and man, they've changed a lot. Maybe for the better, maybe for the worse. It can be different things, but, but people change, but God does not change. And God is the same today as He has ever been, and the same as He will be forever. He was faithful in the beginning, and He will be faithful in the end. He was steadfast in the lives of the Bible characters that we see, uh, that we study in the Word of God, that place their faith in Him, and He will be steadfast in the life of every believer that trusts Him in these days in which we live. God is a steadfast and trustworthy God. And so these gifts of our faithful God are unchanging, they are unfailing, unlike many other things in life. We also see in verse 23 that God's gifts are fresh. God's gifts are fresh. According to this verse, the grace of God is as fresh as the new day. We don't have to worry about there not being enough for us to make it through. God's grace in our lives is always as fresh as the new day. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. They are new every morning. And so uh, Jesus reminded us of this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 34, where he says, Take therefore no thought for, to, for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And so there's no point, I mean, we need to plan, but there's no point in worrying you know, over planning, over worrying, because we don't know what will happen. Things could change completely. You can plan for one thing, you can plan for one situation, you can plan for one, you know, economic, um, um, you know, 
plan that you think the way things are going to go and they can change completely. You can plan, you know, all kinds of things. And we do have to plan, obviously, to a degree. But Jesus says, you know, where it comes to and it turns to worry, of course, he reminds us to cast our care on him, for he careth for us. And um, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with problems, so each day witnesses a new, unfailing, all-sufficient supply of God's marvelous, matchless, amazing grace. And so this is why it's so important that those things are real. They've not been eradicated because we are still living in the world. The burdens, right? The problems, um, the other things that we are facing. But they all have to be filtered um, by by God, by God's word. And so faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so the problems, the burdens will be there, but when we cast our care on him, and we can only do that by faith, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, then we are releasing that. It doesn't mean that we're not living, we're not, you know, we're denying reality. We're still having to live, to live in it, but we're saying, Lord, I give these to you. I'm, I'm casting these cares upon you because you care for me. Your word tells me. And I'm trusting you to help me to deal with this situation uh, and to face the situation. And it might be that he removes it completely. He may remove it. He may eradicate it. But he also might say, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. You see? And when he says that, and we understand it as coming from him, then we can glory even in our infirmities, as the Apostle Paul did. A uh, difficult thing to understand uh, from, our, from the human mind, but by God's grace and through the truth of his word, though, and by the power of his Holy Spirit, we can have a new outlook and, um, as we face difficulties and struggles and help others to face those difficulties and struggles in life. And so God is faithful in his grace. God is faithful in his gifts. And we see thirdly in verses 24 through 26, that God is faithful in his goodness. The Lord is the Lord is my portion, saith my soul, therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. This from the, from the weeping prophet, from the one who went through and had no consolation from those around him. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke of his root of his youth. He sitteth alone and keepeth silence because he hath borne it upon him. He putteth his mouth in the dust, if so be that there may be hope. And so he understood that his consolation and his hope, you know, he, he might receive it from others, but God was his strength and his hope, and he he was faithful, and he would, and he um, was always able to, um, as he looked and he focused on the Lord, that, that gave him great strength. The word good has the idea of, of pleasant, has the idea of agreeable and excellent, and so it refers, of course, to the character of God himself. This word reminds us that God is ever engaged in that which is best in the lives of his children, even though we may not see it from our perspective at the moment. In the beginning of verse 24, we see that he is a satisfier. God is described as the soul's portion. The soul's portion. This word means share or booty. Share or booty refers to, originally, to the spoils of war. Jeremiah is saying, in the battle of life, God is my reward, my share, and my portion. In the battle of life, God is my reward, my share, and my portion. When the Lord is viewed in this light, he will be all that a person, of course, needs him to be in order to be satisfied, truly satisfied in the soul, in their soul. Psalm 103, verse 5, uh, the psalmist refers to this where he says, Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Not only is he a satisfier, he is a sustainer, as we saw there in verses 24 and 25. God will never fail those who place their trust in him. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 23, Thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. Thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait 
for me. Not a single word of any of his promises will ever uh, fail to be honored by him. In the temporary, in the temporal, or in the moment, it may seem like the one who is following God and uh, trusting God is in a place of failure or in a place of um, ignorance, not understanding the situation, not understanding the times. But the reality is that God will honor the one that continues to wait for him, and he will be able to help others by that faith that he places in God, even though others may mock and may, may ridicule, may not appreciate at all the message and the truth of the faith of the individual who trusts in God, yet um, that person will be vindicated, hopefully by the repentance of others, that they've also put their faith and trust in God, and they come to know him personally as well. Psalm 119, verses 89 and 90, the Bible says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. And so, the word of God, this is why it's so important that our minds be transformed by the word of God, because the Bible says, Thy word is settled in heaven. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Heaven and earth will pass away, but his words will not pass away. The words of men, they're here today, they're gone tomorrow, but God's word abideth forever. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, The grass, with, grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And so if you come to him, if you come to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, listen, he's not going to send you away lost if you come to him with a humble heart. He will never, um, you know, refuse the humble heart. He will never turn anyone away that comes to him um, for salvation. John chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus said, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That is the security that there is in Christ. You can never lose your salvation once you've truly been born again. Your fellowship with God may be broken if you wander from him, but the relationship is there and it's secure. And he wants us to come back to him. If we confess our sin, 1 John 1, 9, the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we look to him for the needs in our life, we will never be disappointed. Philippians 4, 19, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, God knows our needs. Sometimes we don't know our need. We're, we're looking for one thing, and God says, No, that's not really what you need. <laughs> you need this. And so we need to uh, you know, ask him to change our, our, our vantage point, sometimes to change our vision, and, um, and trust him in that regard. Well, not only is he a satisfier and sustainer, of course, as we've seen all along here, verse 26, he is a savior. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord, Jeremiah says. And so in this context, Jeremiah is saying, those that wait upon the Lord will see him bring them out of their troubles. He will see them bring them out of their trials and out of their, their difficulties. He will not fail his children, but in his time, he will deliver them from all of their valleys. And so we need to remember today that God is able to deliver both the saved and the unsaved. This is the hope for all in the Lord Jesus Christ. If we will but come to him, of course, he may be found. He's not far from any one of us. If we would just come to him on his terms, he will meet us of course, right there. For us as Christians, God knows where each of us are today in our spiritual life. He knows um, exactly what our situation is, what our relationship is with Him. He knows what we're going through in our personal lives. He knows our, the weakness of our faith. He knows the strength of our faith. He knows everything there is to know about us, of course. And, um, and so when God shows us through His Word... Um, and you know, because his word is a mirror. So when he allows us to see ourselves for what we are through his word, it's not something that he needs to know. He already knows it, but he wants us to, to know it. He wants us to know it so that then we can we can look to him and we can uh, we can adjust our 
our physical and our spiritual lives in such a way that he might come in and that our relationship with him, of course, will go stronger. But if you have a relationship with somebody, you don't want that relationship to be at a distance. I mean, obviously, there are people in life that we have a closer relationship with than others. But with the God who created us, we have to always work at maintaining and, um, and um, wanting and desiring that relationship to be as close as possible. Um, he's not... Um, he is the one that we can be most secure with. He is the one that we can be most honest with and most open with. The Bible says there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he will help us. He will be with us through situations. But the problem is many times, sadly, Christians um, many times will, if something's happening, something's going on, whether it be in the world or in our own lives, we will actually push God away. Sometimes we do that with people. When we're hurting, when there's difficulty or struggle, instead of, instead of uh, growing closer with those that we should, we sometimes push people away. It's not because of anything that they have done, but, because, but it's because of where we are at. And so the, God is telling us, no, listen, these, um, these thoughts and these ideas that you have of me um, many times, or sometimes, can be of the enemy. He is the accuser of the brethren. He is the one that will try to, to cause us to see God in a light that is wrong, in, a, in a, wrong, um, a wrong picture, a wrong understanding of who God is. And so it's only through the Word of God that we can truly understand who God is and understand that He wants to be near us, even though, of course, He knows us as better than anyone. He knows uh, our frame. He knows our weaknesses. But He says, listen, I'm the one that wants to forgive you, strengthen you, be your savior, and be your guide as you begin, of course, a new year, a new chapter in your life in the new year. And so um, Jeremiah uh, said, is saying, is saying this, that, um, you know, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. And so for us as Christians, we um, know God knows where each of us are today. He knows what we're going through, but he will faithfully keep us, and he will bring us out in his time. Let's look at uh, Psalm chapter 34. Psalm 34, um, verse 15. Psalm 34, we can read it at verse 15. The Bible says, The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth them out of them all. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked. And they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be, shall be desolate. And so we must also remind those that are lost and that feel that they are doomed with no hope that God, of course, can save their soul by his marvelous grace. It's not about, you know, it's not about how bad they are. It's not about how good that they can become. It's about the fact of what they do with the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, if they accept him or if they reject him, if they will but look to him by faith, if they will stop trusting in themselves, if they will stop trusting in their religion, if they will stop trusting in their own goodness, if they will come to God, confess their sin, and call upon the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, God will save them at that moment. Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's what the Bible says. That's the truth of God's word. That's not what the religionists say. That's not what the Calvinists say. They say, oh, you don't know if you're one of the elect. You don't know if God has called you. God has called all. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You see, God has called all, everyone, to come to him 
and to call upon him. Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Revelation 22, 17, whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. You know, Jeremiah had a great faith that could stand amid the wreckage of life, the wreckage, the carnage. That's all he saw all around him, continually. The carnage of sin and of death because of sin. The wages of sin is death. But you see, Jeremiah remembered that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. As you and I face the battles, the burdens, the valleys, the storms, the trials of life, they will come. You're maybe even in the midst of one right now. We must always remember that we are His and that He is able, of course, to carry us safely through. So what kind of battles are you fighting today? What kind of battles will you fight in 2021? We don't know yet, but we need to bring them, of course, to the Father and trust in His unchanging, unfailing faithfulness. If you're lost, listen, you need to be saved. Because the Antichrist is coming. The world order is being set up for His coming kingdom. The kingdom of Antichrist will only be short-lived because Jesus is coming to establish his kingdom. But he's allowing man to see the futility of his own efforts. And that will be, that will be, that will, the culmination of that will be during the reign of the Antichrist when we have a one world economic, political, and religious system that is under his control. No man will be able to buy, sell, or trade without his mark. We don't know what that mark will be, but we understand by all that's happening in our world today that the world is being conditioned for this coming kingdom of Antichrist. And so you need to come to Jesus Christ now because the days are getting darker and people's minds are, are, are becoming more and more blinded by the God of this world. There's a spiritual battle that we're involved in. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You're... Your battle's not with me if you're not saved. Your battle's not with somebody else who's told you something about God. But your battle is with the devil himself. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And you need to come to Jesus Christ and trust him uh, as your Lord and Savior today. And then you can be spared the coming holocaust that's going to come upon this world. An awful time. The worst time in the history of this planet is coming. We don't know when it will come, but it could be tomorrow. It may not be for a while, we don't know, but we know that it is soon. Uh, it's coming, and it's coming quickly, Jesus has told us. And remember, Israel is always God's timepiece. We, what we see happening with Israel, her formation, her being brought back into the land, the clock started ticking, and Jesus said he would bring his people back into the land. He would prepare the land for the people people would come in and then he would bring spiritual revival to Israel. That is already starting. There are more believing uh, Jews, Christian Jews, Messianic Jews in Israel now than there ever has been in the history of the country. And so God is doing something to the time to the, where all Israel will be saved. They're coming in. They're coming in from all over the world. They're coming back to Israel. And um, by so many things we could We've been looking at them, we'll continue to look at them as we continue, as we get back into the book of Revelation. But the fact of the matter is that you could die today and be separated from God for all eternity, sadly, in a place the Bible call, calls hell. God doesn't want you to go there. The Bible says that God created hell for the devil and for his angels. But when we refuse the gift of God, when we refuse the free gift of salvation, and we harden our hearts, just as the children of Israel did when when Jeremiah preached to them and, and, and let them know they needed to repent, they needed to believe, but they hardened their hearts and the judgment of God came down upon them. And it came down very harshly because the wages of sin is death. But my friend, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. I implore you, come to Jesus today while you have opportunity. Come to Him and trust Him. If you're walking through a difficult time in your life and you need help, listen, God will provide the help you need. He is always near, and He is always ready and able to come in like a flood and to change you and help you and strengthen you. If you're struggling with the flesh, maybe you're struggling with, with um, some habitual sin, something that you've been involved in in the past, something that's keeping, keeping you from coming to Christ because you think, I need to clean this up. 
Come to Christ as you are, and He will change you. That work will begin in your heart where you will be weaned off this world, and you will grow closer and stronger in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. In your own strength, you can never shake off the, the shackles and the burdens of sin. Only Jesus can break that, but you need to come to Him as you are. There is help for you today. I hope that you can say, like Jeremiah said, as he looked at the situation all around him, as he looked at the world, and then he looked to God, he said, Great is thy faithfulness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you for the truth of it. And Lord, we can identify with Jeremiah, with the weeping prophet, because as we look at this world, it breaks our heart. We look at the situation, the condition that this world is in, and we think of people that we know, people that we love, that don't know you, the people that mock you, people that mock the, the Bible, mock the gospel, mock the truth of God. And um, yet they've never investigated it themselves. They've never looked themselves. They're just parroting what somebody else has said. And, and because it uh, allows them to continue to live in their sin, it, it, it's a good, uh, it's a good, um, um, a good philosophy to hang on to. But Lord, we know that everyone deep in their heart knows that they have sinned. Their conscience reminds them of their, the fact that they are separated from you because of their sin. And Lord, we pray, Father, that, that anyone that's listening to this message today, if they don't know you as Savior, that they might recognize their sin, acknowledge their sin, come to you with their sin and say, God, I thank you for the gift of salvation. Please be merciful to me. Forgive me my sin and give me new life. And Lord, we know that you will answer that prayer every time for anyone that would come to you with a, with a, with a humble, with a repentant heart. You will in no wise cast out. You will forgive them of their sin. You will cleanse them of their sin. And you will fill them with your Holy Spirit and change, begin to change their life. Father, I pray for each of us, Lord, as believers, as we enter this new year. Lord, help us to, uh, to learn from the prophet Jeremiah, who was weeping for the sins of the people, weeping for his own sins and for the sins of the people, and wanting to continue to bring the message. Even though he didn't see one convert, he was faithful to the call. And Lord, help us as believers to be faithful to the call as ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ and his great ministry of reconciliation. The darkness is growing darker each day. The curtain, we understand, is near closing on this dispensation. And the time of the kingdom of the Antichrist, the rule of the Antichrist, is near even at the door. But Father, help us to continue to warn others and point them to the grace and mercy and the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, and we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Continue to pray for one another. We are thankful that those who were suffering from um, COVID are recovering, and continue to pray for one another to that end. Continue to pray for um, our God's grace and guidance in this year ahead, that we might be able to meet again very soon. Um, at this point, it looks like the 17th of January. Let's be in prayer for that first service. Let's be in prayer that we have a good time of fellowship that Sunday and that um, the Lord will, will bless our time together and pray for, um, continue to pray for one another in these days. Wednesday night, 7 p.m., um, with midweek service, we're going to be back in the book of Hebrews and be able to pray together or I'll remind you of some prayer requests and I will tomorrow email out the, the prayer list so that you can have that personally. God bless you and goodbye for now.